Hi, I'm Ben. I'm Liz. And I'm Mari. And this, this is, is our dream, dream vacation, vacation home. home. Our building has been designed to go right on the edge of Muskoka Lake in, by Bracebridge. Uh, it has a footprint of 599 meters squared, a uh, floor dimension of 14.975 meters by a length of 45 meters, a wall height of 4 meters with a total height from the bottom of the building to the top of the truss of 11.5 meters. So this is the layout, uh, a plan view and front view of the building. As you can see, the roofing is held by a truss, and at each of the exterior joints, there is a purlin uh, to hold up the supports for the roof. So the truss itself spans 14.975 meters. Uh, they sit 50 centimeters on center. We have applied a dead load, two live loads, one for the exterior, one for the interior. Snow and wind loads, all factored per the Ontario Building Code. Uh, as you can see from this diagram, the loads uh, acting on the exterior of the truss were um, applied as UDLs acting downwards on the truss. The wind was uh, applied as UDLs acting perpendicular to the truss members. And the interior loads, the insulation and the interior attic live occupancy load uh, were applied on the inner uh, member of the truss. When you factor them based on the Ontario Building Code, the wind is not applied because it is not the most conservative um, caseload. So with the purlins that were applied on each joint, converted all of the UDL values into point loads on, acting on each exterior joint and the interior loads were treated as UDL points acting on each of the interior joints. Uh, it, the truss was analyzed for axial loading in the members, for bending if applicable of the members, and for deflection when applicable. And for the interior truss members, uh, it was analyzed for combined loading. The truss loads then act down onto a beam, the flexural member. The worst case span for our beams is seven meters. Uh, the reactions from the truss were applied to the beam as point loads first every 50 centimeters. And then we found the equivalent uniformly distributed load of those and treated the beam as a simply supported beam with one uniformly distributed load acting on top of it. And the beam was analyzed for bending resistance, shear resistance, bearing resistance, and deflection. From there, the reaction caused from the beam sitting on the member was applied to a column. Uh, this image is an example of an exterior column, so we have the reaction of the weight of the beam and the trusses and the roof sitting on top of it, and the wind pressure acting on the side causing some bending. The worst case scenario height was 4 meters. Uh, we treated it with a tributary width from the beam of 7 meters. Uh, the reaction from the beam was treated as acting axially, uh, right in the center, and the wind pressure was acting laterally, so it had to be analyzed for compressive resistance, bending resistance, shear resistance, deflection, and combined loading. So we designed our shear walls to um, resist the lateral wind forces. Here, um, the trajectory values determined by height and length of the walls. We took the height of the roof and half the height of the actual wall to get the force that would be acting on this point here and we know this point here is going to be a larger force than this so that's the one we use to decide our shear force. Shear acting on the top board there, that's going to be the strong force. Okay. Um, and we picked a paneling shear resistance per meter. 
So the flooring system designed for this our building uh, has the support beams resting on top of the foundation with uh, support joists uh, going in between them. The floor beams rest at a uh, five meters uh, from center to center between, and the support beams in, uh, running between them have a center to center of 0.5 meters so that they can hold up uh, an even distribution of the floor itself. And the floor uh, system was analyzed for uh, bending the shear and deflection for the entire building.